This is a very special day in our church. I thank the Lord for celebrating our diversity, for celebrating the international ministry and the international family in Christ that we are. Vladimir, as you were reading the scripture, I was hoping that as these services are translated in Russian that I sound exactly like you. I like that very much. I'm thankful that you're here. As I began to prepare for this service next month, last Monday, I, I began to think about what do you say at International Day to indicate that God tells our friends they're welcome here and we have a special word for us. And I began to realize that God's word is the same to everyone. That the same word he speaks to Kosciuszko, he speaks to Korea. That the same word to Jackson, to Japan. That his word is for everyone, that there is no difference in the word of God for any of us. That all of us are the same in our sinful state. We're all saved in the same way. We're all loved in the same manner by our Lord Christ. And so I kind of gave up on that, looking for a special message. And, and just because I've been so concerned about what it means to praise and worship God, I've been studying that lately. I thought I would preach to you from Psalm 100. But then a bomb of hatred went off in Los Angeles. Uh, hatred exploded in that city. It made me realize that there are some very basic things that all of us believe that maybe do need to be stated and need to be said. I don't claim to be able to make any kind of lasting or penetrating decision about the Rodney King beating. I want to make it known very clearly that I, I have great respect for our police people. Uh, they walk into things that I run from. Uh, they risk their lives and put them on the line day after day. Without police protection in our land, you and I could not be here this morning. We'd have to be at home, barred and locked into our houses, protecting what property we may have. We plan to have a very special day soon to salute uh, the police people of Jackson and what they mean to us. We love these people. But I'll have to admit that as I watched that 81 seconds of that beating, for the first time in my life, I felt some shame for our system and some anger about that thing happening. And I'm grateful that so many policemen across the land have voiced that same kind of feeling and say that was unnecessary. I have never understood how we can send people into a jungle to capture man-eating tigers and lions and boa constrictors and gorillas without even putting a bruise on them and bring them back to a zoo. And yet when we capture people, it seems it's necessary sometimes to bruise and to break bones. And I don't understand that, even though I do understand that lions and tigers and snakes and gorillas don't carry guns. Some of you know that one of my very dear brothers in Christ is E.V. Hill, a much-loved and respected man. He lives in the area of South Los Angeles that's faced so much destruction this week. He is pastor there. He, he lives there. His church is there. His people are there. I've tried to call this much-loved brother a couple of times. The operators say there simply is no way to call into that area. And I, I w would wish that you would pray for E.V. and for his congregation and for all those people and remember that while some hundreds may have caused that destruction, there are hundreds of thousands of people who have been hurt by it. Forty-one have lost their lives and others are hurt. And the economic impact will be felt for many, many years from that kind of destruction. And I want us to pray for them. The word from God is Colossians 3, beginning in verse 11. Remember, this word is God-breathed. This is God's word, a word he speaks to his family of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, a word he speaks to you and me. And he says here, that is, in the family of God, here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as God's people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with one another and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, 
and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Thanks to God the Father through him. Our Lord is saying in verse 11, here there's no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is all. He's simply saying there are no walls or partition built between God's people. That there are no people common or preferred, there are no people wanted and unwanted, that our Lord God through the love of Christ has said to you and me, we are, there is no difference, for all have sinned, there is no difference. God loves us and sees us all the same. In the fellowship of the Lord God, there are no distinctions, there are no walls built. In his day, he would say there were no, there's no Jew nor Greek as far, as far as God is concerned. There are no people who are bond or, or, or slave or free. When he speaks of barbarians, they call a barbarian in that day anyone who didn't speak Greek. When they speak of Scythians, they speak of the people they looked upon as almost animal-like and brutal such people. They were not accepted by society. He said, when we come together under the umbrella of believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, every one of those walls is gone. I thought about you and thought about Jackson and Los Angeles and how I thank God for you and this fellowship. I thanked him for the fact that several years ago, many years ago, this church made it a policy that anyone who knows Jesus Christ is welcomed in this fellowship, that there will be no distinction according to race. I remember on that year, 1976 it was, we were meeting in the building, the part back there that used to have the balcony around it and we were meeting still two times on Sunday morning. We were already in three Sunday schools, but in two worship services, and that 1,500-seat sanctuary was so packed out twice that when the deacons came to, to do their service to the church, they sat on the front row, and there was no place for them to sit because the room was so filled in those services. So when the service, was come to the time, when the service came to the time of invitation, they would leave the front row and go stand up against the wall on the side to make room for people who made decisions to sit on that front bench. And I recall one day, there was a man who was watching our service on television and he, he got under conviction. He hurriedly dressed and he drove to our church, got here during the time of invitation. He found one of the deacons, Dr. Harold Caver, standing against the wall. He handed him this card, this orange and black business card that says Lawrence W. Mangary, 101.7 WWLM. And on the back of the card he wrote, I'm black. Can I join? And Dr. Caver brought that card to me, and I said, you go get that man and bring him here. And he brought him, and I nervously introduced him to you back in 76. And I saw the line to welcome that man to the fellowship of this church be four times as long as usual that day. And Joe Triplett and I stood on either side of the man as people came by to welcome him, and I heard him invited to more Sunday school classes than I knew we had. As people brought him into that fellowship, and we're glad to have him. I've often wondered why there are more, no more black people than there are who join our church. Uh, every now and then I have occasion to hear some of my black brothers preach and then I'm made painfully aware of at least one reason why they might not be joining our church and prefer the black churches. But I'm thankful that this door is open. I've lived in three different states, in Mississippi and Texas and in California. And I can say to you with my soul, I believe that in this state, People live together better than any other place I've been. And you are a people who know what it is to understand the walls must come down if we're to live in harmony and peace. And this is what the Word is saying. Here, here, there are no people black or white. There, there are no people preferred or common. There are no rich or poor. We're all the same in the sight of God. We're all the same people. And our Lord would want us to know that. Another verse just like that is found in Galatians 3. In fact, you find this statement many places in God's Word. But hear this, in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. 
Some of you sports fans remember Coach John Wooden, who was coach of UCLA. He had 10 national championships. And one day, some years back, a reporter asked one of his players, how is it that you have people on your team who are black and white and so different? How, how does Coach Wooden mold you into one team so you can function together well? And the player was almost aggravated, but as politely as he could, he said, Coach Wooden doesn't see color. I hope you understand that these verses from the inspired Word of God are saying that God Almighty doesn't see color. Do you understand that heaven is an interracial neighborhood? That that's what heaven is about. It's there. Now, I'm not talking about who's going to marry your sister. I do not recommend at all interracial marriages. That makes it even tougher to keep a home together, makes it very hard and unfair for children of such a union. But I'm saying this, that there must be in the mind of every follower of the Lord Christ, there must be the mind that there has to be for every human being equal opportunity, equal justice, and an equal recognition of the dignity of being a human. I had a friend my last summer before and, and uh, last semester of high school and the summer before going to college, his name was Carl. We worked at a service station for Mr. Marvin McCleskey, the Texaco service station in my hometown. We opened it up at 5.30 in the morning and closed it at 10 at night before and after school. And then during the summer, we kept those kind of hours and also on Saturday. It was a real service station. You know, back when service stations were, were service stations and not filling stations. You know, now you just go and fill it up yourself and you fill up with candy or groceries or whatever but there were service stations in those days we pumped the gas and we checked the oil and we washed the windshields and we checked the tires and and we hand washed and waxed those cars and Carl did some mechanical work it was a service station Carl learned that I love to play baseball and so he introduced me to some very fine baseball players we played together on Sunday afternoon and then we had one of those economic depressions come that come often to all filled towns uh, when the supply of oil becomes more than the demand, well, a lot of bad things happen in places like my little hometown, and things got so bad, Mr. McCleskey had to let one of us go. And since Carl was a little more skilled in what we did, and I was about to go off to college, I was let go, and I didn't see him anymore after that when I went off to school. When I got to school, our baseball team that first spring played Brooks Army Medical Center. A special baseball team and special services of the Air Force, of, of the Army, where people were brought there who were professionals in this. And we played them. They had on that team Dr. Bobby Brown, who became a, a medical doctor, but also was third baseman for the New York Yankees and lately has been commissioner of the American League. Uh, Bob Turley, the well-known perfect World Series baseball pitcher, was on that team. And Don Newcomb from the Brooklyn Dodgers was on that team, too. And when the team got to town and stayed in the place on the campus that was designated for them, well, some of us went over there. We wanted to meet these people we'd heard so much about. And we met some of them and asked where Don Newcomb was. And they said, well, he can't stay on the campus. It's against the state law for him to spend the night on this campus. And so he's in a cheap motel over in town. And I realized that my friend Carl couldn't, not only couldn't attend that tax-supported state institution I attended, but he couldn't even spend the night. And that those people that I'd played baseball with who were much better than me did not have the opportunity that I had to get a college education playing baseball, at least not in that school. And I'm grateful that all of that has changed. I'm thankful that it's not like that anymore. And I think we as Christians have to understand that in the mind and heart of God, there is no black or white. There is no rich or poor. There is no common or preferred that we are all in Christ, and all that really matters is Christ. And we're looking at a world around us that is at constant war, a world around us that is deteriorating because people cannot function together, a nation that may be falling apart because of hatred. And we understand how very serious these words are and how you and I have the hope for the world, for our city, for our nation, in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's, hear this word in verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. 
Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. God's word to us as followers of Christ, he says, as God's people, clothe yourselves. Just like in the morning you get up, you decide that you will put on compassion, kindness, humility, and gentleness, and patience. And then he says, and above all that, put on love as though the, the coat you show, the garment that the world is going to see is love. Clothe yourselves like that. It's not a suggestion, it's a command. It's a thing we do not naturally but purposefully every day of our lives. We put on these virtues and live this way. And above all, the thing that the world is to see in us is love. It's love. And then the Word talks about attitude, about motivation, and about action for those who are serious about following Christ. Verse 15, the attitude. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace. Wouldn't it be wonderful if all people could understand our calling is to make peace, to be peacemakers? Now, these are the kind of people who will be blessed Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. They're the ones who make the world what it ought to be. A snatch of poetry that I don't know where it came from. I, I don't know who said it, but it has been haunting me this, this whole week. When will I bless the world, says God? When every sorry human sod stops hating every alien sod, that's when, I, when, that's when I'll bless the world, says God. Let peace be your attitude. Let it be your attitude. And then for the motivation, for that strong launching point from inside you, the thing that causes you to be what you are, listen to verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. Let the word of Christ be your motivation. Let this be the foundation for all that you do as you serve him. And the action in verse 17, in whatever you do, and whatever you do, whether in word or indeed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. I have been thanking God for you this week, thinking about the particular place that God has put us as his family. We made that decision, though, several years ago that we would stay at the hub of the metropolitan area of Jackson. We live in a metropolitan area of 400-plus thousand people. 41% of those are black. And we have put ourselves here. We have invested these millions of dollars in this place that says this is how we feel about the Lord God and this is who we are and we're at the center of this city saying that we want to minister in the name of God to all of this area and to all of its people. And there is not one week, not one single week that passes but what that some member of this church is reaching out in ministry and love and compassion to the black community of Jackson, Mississippi. And tonight in that missions fest, as we look at a very special time in the 7 o'clock service, you will be told about the many, many things that are going on in the name of Christ and told how you can be a part in that, about the action, about caring. And I, I thank God so very much for you, for all of that. It was on the 29th of October in 1990 that we met for the first time in this building. Never forget how, how awesome it was to me and what a grateful thing that this building was built to the glory of our Lord. On that Sunday, on that Sunday, I preached to you, and I don't expect you to remember this, I'm going to tell you, I preached to you about John 21, about Jesus finding the disciples, having fished all night and caught nothing. He said, fellas, you're fishing on the wrong side of the boat. Fish on the right side of the boat. And I told you that we were fishing, that we need to fish on the right side of the boat. And you encouraged me for saying that we don't fish with a lure, we fish with a net. We're not using specialized lures to catch on just very special kind of fish, but we fish with a net, the Lord said. Cast the net on the right side of the boat. And you encouraged me for saying that uh, this is not the country club at prayer, this church. Nothing wrong with the country club, but the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is not the country club at prayer. Now, this is not the first National Baptist Church. This is not the first Baptist country club. This is a church for all people. Anyone who knows Christ is equal. 
Someone might ask you, is this a white person's church? And we'll say, yes. Is this a black person's church? Yes. Is this an Oriental church? Yes. Is this an Indian church? Yes. Is this an Hispanic church? Yes. Is this a church for anyone from anywhere in all the world? And the answer very obviously this morning is yes. Is this a rich person's church? Yes. Is this a poor person's church? Yes. Is this a church for all the people in between? Yes. Is this a children's church? Yes, we dedicated a baby at the early service. Is this a young person's church? Yes, they're a big part of the ministry of this church. Is this a, a young adult's church? Yes. Is this a single adult's church? Yes. Is this a married adult's church? Yes. Is this a church for middle-agers? Yes. Is this a church for elderly people? Yes. And we have in our services today Claire Greer. One of our active members, she's celebrating her 95th birthday with us today. This is a church for elderly people, too. This is a family, a family of faith, a family of people who have come together in Jesus Christ and been made one in all the walls whereby people separate themselves are down. We're a family of faith in the Lord Christ who said to us, whosoever will may come. And as we look at the world around us that cannot cure its own ills, it's very obvious we can't stop wars. We can't stop hatred. We can't make things work right. It's very obvious to anyone who looks at the world around us and its economic problems and its, and its hatred problems and its war that this world is on its way down and out. And we have the only hope we really have the only hope if God's people would just get serious about it. There's no political answers. Americans have believed that lie for too long. There's no economic answers. The only hope is people learning to live in love together. And in this scripture, you'll notice that gratitude and thanks is woven into each one of these things. When it talks about attitude, about about. Uh, the, the, the very motivation and about the action. Listen to what he says. About attitude, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. Let the word of Christ, it says in 16, dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your heart to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Do you understand what he's saying? He's saying there is a way out. There is a hope. There is a way of healing. There is a way of bringing peace, and you're it. So thank God for that. It's not hopeless. You are the answer. You have the answer. You're a part of this. Thank God that you're a part of bringing the answer, the only answer that works to this world. Father, I pray you'll lead us now. I pray your spirit will bore deeply past all the hard crust of sin and selfishness and unconcern, and you'll make us see how vital it is that your people be the people we were called to be, or the world has no hope. In Jesus' name, amen. We invite you to come. We invite you to come and profess your faith in Christ, to schedule your baptism as a first obedience in following Christ, to become a member of this church, to do whatever thing may be need to be done publicly in your life to announce your intention to be one who comes under the rule and reign of Jesus Christ in God's kingdom. We're going to ask that everyone remain seated during this time of invitation. This is crucial to worship. The word worship literally means to do the thing that pleases God. If you don't do that, you haven't worshiped, even though you've been here. And so this is crucial. So I hope you'll want whatever your circumstance, whether it be to make a public decision or to make a private decision in your own heart, that you'll do the business with God that you need to do those who will make public decisions, we invite you when the music begins simply to stand and walk to the front. There will be some very happy people to meet you, to greet you, to welcome you, to rejoice in your decision to honor our Lord Christ. Would you come now as we sing?